Judges chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. The Bible says, When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Harasheth Hagoyim. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor, and take with you ten thousand men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun? And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand." And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. So she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, he went up with 10,000 men under his command, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber, the Kenite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree at Zenaim, which is beside Kadesh. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. By the way, do you think I had to practice these names this week? What do you think? I did. So Sisera gathered together all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him from Herosheth Hagoyim to the river Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Herosheth Hagoyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Jump down with me to verse 23. It says, So on that day... God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. Let's roll on just a little bit into chapter 5. It says, Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, When leaders lead in Israel... When the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord, this Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. There was war in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Jump down to verse 20. It says, They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. And if you jump down with me to the very last line of this chapter, in verse 31, we'll end there. It says, So the land had rest for 40 years. My message this morning is entitled, Iron Chariots, Iron Chariots. Let's pray and let's invite God's blessing as we share the word together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for gathering us together around your word this morning. 
Jesus said that your word is like seed. So, Father, would you touch our hearts now? Let our hearts be good soil that can bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Lord Jesus, you said that the words you speak to us, they are spirit and they are life. So would you send your spirit and minister life to us from the word this morning? If you agree, would you say amen, amen. and amen? For the last few weeks, we've been sharing stories of faith. We've been exploring the lives of heroes of the Bible and the defining moments of faith in their lives. We've been looking to see what we can learn from them and how their stories can encourage us today. Right now, here at Harvest Time, we're experiencing our own defining moment of faith. We're just four weeks away now from our first services in our new sanctuary on Christmas Eve. Praise the Lord. It's a wonderful milestone for us because it's the anniversary of our very first ever Harvest Time service on Christmas Eve in 1983. Right now, we're trusting God for an urgent need that we have. We need $250,000 in cash to come in so that we can obtain the temporary certificate of occupancy for the phase two sanctuary. Pastor Glenn has called us to seek the Lord together in a fast, a fast of consecration that will run from this Friday, December 1st, through the 10th of the month. And we're not asking you to fast the whole 10 days, but we are asking everyone to fast with us for at least three of those days. And of course, if you feel the Lord uh, leading you to do more, you can do more, but we're asking God to search our hearts over these 10 days and to deal with any spiritual cause that could possibly be hindering the flow of blessing to us. We're going to seek the Lord together, and we just want to thank you so much for standing with us in your prayers for phase two every day. You know, Joshua told the people, not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. Amen. We serve a faithful God. And today we're looking at a defining moment of faith in the lives of two people who work together to liberate God's people, Deborah and Barak. If you're not familiar with it, the book of Judges tells us what happened after Joshua died and the Israelites had come into their promised land. This was an unsettled time for God's people. The Bible says that in those days, every man did what was right in his own eyes. How many of you know that's a recipe for a disaster? When every man is a law unto himself, the result will always be chaos. The book of Judges tells us how God's people got stuck in a cycle of blessing and backsliding. When they became prosperous, they would forget God and begin to serve foreign gods. When they did so, God would let them come under the control of their neighbors. Some pagan king would oppress them. And eventually, they would turn and repent and cry out to God for deliverance. However, once the people were delivered and the pressure was off, the cycle would start over again. Israel would walk away from the Lord again, and they would turn back to idols. Many times, God graciously raised up leaders to help them, leaders who were called judges. And these judges were kind of like the judges in our culture, but with more authority. So we can read how God raised up many deliverers like Gideon and Samson. But although the judges could save the people from their military enemies, they couldn't necessarily stop the moral decay of the people. <clears throat> Deborah was one of these judges. When we first meet Deborah in chapter 4, we're simply told that she was a prophetess. In some way that we are not told, God caused her to become so prominent and so respected that the people accepted her and embraced her as their leader. And as he did with other judges, God gave Deborah such an anointing and gave her such leadership ability that the people had to acknowledge that her calling came from God. God raised up Deborah with what I think was perfect timing because this was a real low point in Israel's history. You see, in a few short generations, God's people had gone from hunting giants to being hunted down. Verse 1 of chapter 4 tells us that once the previous judge before Deborah died, a man called Ehud, 
the Israelites fell away from God once again. And in order to make his prodigal people turn back to him, God allowed them to be oppressed by Jabin, the king of Canaan. And Israel's situation was truly dire. First, Jabin had iron chariots. I'm kind of expecting one of those to show up on 684 uh, any day now, the way things are going. Jabin had iron chariots, and that doesn't mean chariots that are constructed of iron. Scholars tell us that this means he had chariots with iron scythes on the wheels. Now, if you've seen the old movie Ben-Hur, then you'll know that one chariot rider could use his wheels to damage the chariot of another man. But this was something even worse because Jabin's chariots had metal blades that were used to literally mow down the enemy. To make things worse, Israel possessed nothing that could counter this weapon. You see, under the law of Moses, God had forbidden Israel to breed many horses, to multiply horses. God wanted his people to depend on him and not depend upon the strength of their own army. So while the other nations around them had powerful cavalry forces, Israel had none at all. And even without their iron chariots, the Canaanites were still a vicious enemy. You know, the Israelites lived in a rough neighborhood, both then and today. And like many of their neighbors, the Canaanites worshipped evil spirits, and they even sacrificed their own children to idols. They engaged in every kind of wicked practice that you can imagine. So much so that God commanded Israel in his law not even to learn the abominable things that the Canaanites did. God said these are things that will defile the land. Not only were the Canaanites heartless, they were very motivated to keep Israel down. The Canaanites probably hated Israel more than they hated any other people. You see, they were motivated by revenge. Back in a time earlier when Joshua was conquering the land, Joshua had destroyed the Canaanites' main city of Hatzor. Now, Hatzor was a ruin still in the days of Deborah that we're reading about, and yet Jabin, their king, still kept the title of king of Hatzor. See, that was a wound for them, a matter of pride. And they, they were all too happy to keep Israel as miserable as they could. Jabin here in this story is a symbol of the devil and how our enemy oppresses God's people. Jabin is not really a name, it's a title, much like Pharaoh is a title in Egypt. And that word Jabin, it means wise or discerning. And indeed, he was wise in matters of evil. He was crafty, just like Satan. Jabin's stronghold was destroyed by Joshua, and yet he was still persistent. He came back regardless to harass the saints and so it is with the devil. The devil's kingdom was ruined by our Joshua, the Lord Jesus. And you know that's his name, by the way. And yet for the time being, our enemy still harasses us out of his ruined kingdom. And just like the devil, Jabin had many servants. One of them was Sisera, his general. Sisera means servant of Ra, the god of the Egyptians. Can you imagine if your name literally meant that you were a servant of an idol, a servant of a devil? Sisera represents evil men who act as a servant of the devil, whether they know it or not. Now, church, I want you to notice what Jabin and Sisera did, how they operated, and maybe this will help somebody understand the tactics of the enemy against people and against the church. This story shows that they came first to divide the people of God. The Canaanites set up shop. They set up their base of operations in such a way that they were cutting Israel apart so that the northern tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun that were mentioned would find it hard to stay in relationship with the southern tribes. They isolated God's people from each other. They also created confusion 
and fear among the people. And that's what the enemy does to us. Sisera's headquarters was in, the, was in this place called Harasheth. Now that word means a forested place, a place of forest. Well, that may sound very nice, but church, I, w- I want to remind you that in ancient times, forests were not pretty places where you went to go hiking and take selfies. <laughs> forests were dark and dangerous places that you stayed away from. Because if you went in there, you couldn't see your enemy. He was lying in wait for you, and you couldn't see him or attack him. Now, on top of all these things, the people knew that Sisera was coming against them with weapons that they couldn't hope to match. Not only could they not match them, but the Canaanites had 900 of them, and Israel had precisely zero. Now, did all of this have an effect on God's people? It absolutely did. First, we find that Israel was demoralized. They had given up resisting, and they had reached the point where all they could do was cry out to God for his mercy. We also read that Israel was defecting over to the enemy. Deborah says, if you caught it, that they were choosing new gods for themselves. In effect, they were saying, well, if we can't beat them, I guess we have to join them. Israel was also disarmed. Deborah says in her song that not a single weapon could be seen among 40,000 men. Doesn't mean they didn't have any weapons, but they were so intimidated that they would not openly display the weapons that they did have. I hope somebody caught a hold of that today. Don't let your circumstances convince you to drop your weapons when the Word of God says that your weapons are strong through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But in this story, church, you see, Jabin had beaten down the spirit of the people. He had beaten them down so low, he didn't even need to take those chariots out of the garage. What about you and I today? Do you feel as if the enemy and his horsemen have beaten you down a little bit? Does it sometimes feel like the enemy has free reign to ride all over your life in his chariots of iron? Like Israel, do you sometimes feel a little bit outnumbered and maybe a little bit outgunned? Maybe you are fighting the good fight of faith for yourself, but perhaps you're here today and you have a loved one. You have a child, a grandchild, and as you look at their situation, it seems like they've been oppressed by the enemy for far too long a time, just like Israel was. How can we overcome both for ourselves And for those we care about when the enemy is coming at us with chariots of iron. I want to explore with you three bold things that Deborah and Barak did when they were facing those 900 chariots. And may the Holy Spirit give us understanding today. How do we overcome the enemy's iron chariots? Three things to do. And the first one is this. Dare to stand and fight. Dare to stand and fight. In verse 6 of chapter 4, Deborah told Barak, Hasn't the Lord God of Israel commanded you to go and deploy troops? When the enemy has intimidated and demoralized us, there comes a time when you have to decide to stand and fight. There comes a time when you have to draw a line, draw a circle around your inheritance and say, devil, it's time for you to get out and to stay out. Four thoughts about this. First, people who dare to stand and fight have developed a fiery spirit. Church, we will never overcome chariots unless we develop a fiery spirit against the enemy and his works. You see, somewhere along the way, Israel had lost the zeal to hold on to what God had given them. Seems there weren't many left who had the burning spirit of a Joshua or a Caleb. Deborah said in her song that 40,000 men should have been able to fight but they wouldn't draw their swords. Thank God Deborah had a different spirit. 
Now, in the translation we read, uh, in Hebrew, it says Deborah was a woman of Lapidoth. But many people would question whether that's an accurate translation. You see, in Hebrew, that name, Lapidoth, is a female word. It's not a typical man's name. And the word Lapidoth means torches. So, in fact, this may not even be a reference to a husband at all. Because you can actually literally read the Hebrew of that verse to say that Deborah was a woman of torches. In other words, Deborah was a woman on fire. Barak had a different spirit also. His name, I like this, his name means lightning. And while others were afraid to even show their spears, Barak gathered an army and he ran downhill at a powerful enemy. Church, when it's time to resist the devil, we need believers, we need leaders who have the burning intensity of torches and the willingness to strike quickly like lightning. Jesus said, you have an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But some believers have grown too timid to even defend themselves with the shield of faith, much less draw their sword. I'm here to tell you this morning, Deborah did not view herself as a damsel in distress. Maybe we just haven't always spent enough time in God's word, can I say it, to build up our faith. And if we don't, when the devil comes at us, when he comes at our home with his iron chariots, then all that many of us can do, unfortunately, is just wave the white flag of surrender. God forbid. Friends, God is shouting to us here, just like Deborah called to Barak and said, get up. Get up and be torches. Get up and be fire. Get up and be lightning against the enemy. Sisera was sitting in a dark forest, in a place of gloom and darkness. But Deborah was sitting out in the open, speaking the word of God. She was sitting under a palm tree, which was always a symbol of victory for the Jews. She knew the Lord, and because of that, Deborah was unafraid. I also see that people who dare to fight are those who have seen the oppression of God's people and have taken it to heart. You know, we live in a very busy and distracted world, don't we? Have you seen this thing in the news where some of these cities are putting padding around lampposts because people are walking into them on their phones? <laughs> we live in a busy and distracted world and it can be easy for us to grow calloused to the plight of those who are under the devil's attack. Apathy can rise up within us to the point where I even become passive about the enemy's advances in my own life. But Deborah refused to be apathetic or to be fatalistic. You know, well, what are you going to do? Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. No. She looked around and she lamented how the enemy had ruined the lives of her people. Deborah said the highways were deserted. Travelers couldn't go on the road anymore. They might get mud. They had to go on the little paths. Village life ceased, she says, in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. Now, we didn't read all of chapter 5. It's lengthy. But if you study it for yourself after your leftovers this afternoon, you'll see... You'll see that people could not even go to the wells to draw water without having arrows shot at them. Village life ceased, Deborah said, but you know what? Deborah refused to just accept that as what we would call in our uh, vernacular the new normal. She refused to get used to it. She was concerned for how the young people were growing up. She said she arose, what, as a mother in Israel. Some of us had praying mothers and praying grandmas. And church, now it's our turn to pick up that mantle and become the prayer warriors that our children need us to be. And men, this applies to us too, doesn't it? You know, when Samuel was old and gray, Samuel told the backsliding nation, he said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. May God help us so that we take it to heart 
when we see the enemy crushing the lives of so many young people. We need to stand and fight so that we can give hope to people who have never tasted victory before. Bible says that Jabin had oppressed Israel for 20 years. It's a long time to be oppressed in that kind of situation. And in that 20 years, something happened. A new generation of warriors came up. They came of age. You see, 20 was the age at which Israelite men were first counted in the census and were expected to be warriors, to be in the army. Church, it's so important that we get this. Please listen to what I'm saying. In Deborah's time, as young people were joining the army, Israel's army was rapidly becoming an army of men who had never seen a move of God. Now sure, these soldiers knew the stories of Joshua and Caleb, but they had never seen for themselves God's power over the enemy. Why? Because their entire lives had been spent under the boots of the Canaanites. Just like them, our younger generations need to see the power of God firsthand. Our kids don't need to hear any more great stories. They are great stories, but our kids don't need to hear any more great stories about what God did back in the 19th century when you and I went to school. No, they need to have their own testimony of how God put Satan under their feet. They need to see God moving so that the world will never be able to convince them that God doesn't deliver people like that anymore. And if you and I have a living faith and a fiery spirit that dares to stand and fight, we can help them to see the salvation of God with their own two eyes. You know, it's the heart of our God. Our God also wants the oppressed victims to be able to take back their stolen birthright. When Deborah summoned Barak, she told him, Barak, take soldiers from Naphtali and from Zebulun. Now, who were they? Naphtali and Zebulun were the very tribes up north who had known defeat and occupation. The Canaanites, as they were driving their chariots around, were driving their chariots on their inheritance. Ultimately, they would have to face the Canaanites nose to nose and drive them out. I hope somebody gets this today. It wasn't the job of the other tribes to win back their inheritance for them. Ultimately, it was their job. That's not to say that the other tribes wouldn't help, but listen, church, your inheritance is your inheritance. Now, if Zebulun was ever going to grow up strong enough to help evict the devil from somebody else's inheritance, then he was first going to have to secure his own inheritance. And as a friend of mine likes to say, that's good preaching right there. God wanted to train his own beloved and beaten down people how to hold their own territory and keep the trespassers out. And finally, we can dare to stand and fight when we cry out to God for his mercies. I don't read that Deborah ever took up a sword. She wasn't a Joan of Arc type figure. But I have no doubt that she helped to win this war by, re- by inspiring the people to repent and turn back to the Lord once again. Israel had become discouraged. They had become spiritually careless. They were turning away from the Lord, but now they turned to him and they cried out to their father for help and he graciously answered them when they didn't deserve it. What a lesson for us. When we repent and pray, God's heart will be moved to help us so that deliverance can come. Don't give up praying for your situation. Don't give up praying for the people you know who are laboring today under the oppression of the devil's iron chariots. Don't give up praying for revival in your family. Many of you here, you've got a son, a niece, a nephew that after, used to be on fire for Jesus, and now they don't want to talk about it. Ah, Grandma, come on. Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Don't give up praying for revival. 
here at Harvest Time. Don't give up praying for phase two. Don't give up praying for revival where you work and in the city where you live. You know why? Because there's a God of mercy and he has a secret plan to deal with those iron chariots. How do we deal with iron chariots? First, we dare to stand and fight. And second, we dare to stand in unity. Dare to stand in unity. One of the great secrets of the victory that Deborah and Barak received was their unity and the unity of all the people. It wasn't one specific tribe that cried out for mercy. It was all of them. And you know, it wasn't part of the nation that came to Deborah's palm tree. It was the whole nation. See, way up north, Naphtali and Zebulun, they were in trouble. But Deborah, who was ministering down south, was concerned about them. The people dared to work together with those from different backgrounds. And they didn't care who got the credit. If you can't say amen, say ouch on that one. <laughs> and they dared to work with unlikely people. You know, Barak is one of the greatest examples of spirit-led unity in the entire Bible. He dared to follow and walk in unity with a female leader, right? A lot of us can't do that today. Do you think it was easier in 1100 BC? See, the Bible says that the people came up to Deborah for judgment. And that tells us how highly respected Deborah was because in Hebrew, that Hebrew phrase, coming up, is how they described somebody who was coming to report to his superior. And we noticed that she even had the authority to summon Barak, and he came. Deborah must have been a remarkable person. She was the only woman judge she was the only judge other than Samuel to be called a prophet. She was also the only judge other than Samuel who became a judge even before she did any great exploits. And despite their extremely patriarchal culture, Barak had no trouble listening to Deborah. Listen, why? Because he honored the anointing God had put upon her life. The people understood that they needed each other. And church, the body of Christ will overcome the devil's chariots also when we see that we need each other and that we need each other's gifts. You know, sometimes Barak gets criticized by Bible teachers and Bible commentators. They criticize him. They say he was too cowardly. He was too timid to do anything unless Deborah went with him. And I think that's completely wrong. See, I think Barak was smart. He knew that Deborah was no soldier, and he knew that he was no prophet. Barak was smart enough to know that God needed both of them. He knew that before this thing was over with the Canaanites, he was probably going to need God's instruction a few times, and he was going to need God's timing for battle. And so he asked this anointed prophetess to come with his army. Barak was not walking in fear. He was walking in humility and wisdom. If you study all of chapter 5, you're going to find out that not everybody had the same spirit of faith as those two leaders and could get on board with them in unity. Some of the other tribes did come to help, but we can read about one tribe argued within itself about what to do. They were useless. Another tribe went halfway. The Bible says that they got in their ships, but then they stayed in their ships. That's not very helpful either. Deborah said, here is Zebulon risking his entire life, and some of his brothers can't even decide whether they want to help. They learned, like we often learn in life, that some people are going to be indecisive, some will be afraid, and some will just tell you to get lost. Deborah said, when the leaders lead and when the people willingly offer themselves Bless the Lord. You see, Deborah knew that when people stand together on the word of God, that means good things are going to happen. And church, when you're facing the devil's iron chariots, then you need to take your stand together with those that are like-minded. 
Stand in unity with those that have the same fire that you do. They may have different gifts. They may not look like you. They may have different ways of thinking about things from you. But dare to stand in unity with those who have the same faith in God, the same belief that God can help you. How do we overcome the enemy who oppresses us? Dare to stand and fight. Uh, dare to stand and fight. Dare to stand in unity. And finally, this: dare to believe God for an unlikely victory. Dare to believe God for an unlikely victory. Now, that picture is actually a picture of the real Mount Tabor, taken about 120 years ago. But that's that's what it looks like. You could see the mountain outcropping, and you can see the valley uh, down below. Even though Israel was growing in boldness and unity, church victory was still very unlikely unless God intervened. Because while Barak was gathering his army and bringing them up that mountain, the enemy was not growing any weaker. In fact, from a natural standpoint, things had actually gotten worse. Somebody, a distant relative, don't read anything into that, boy, uh, a distant relative betrayed the Israelites and, and told Sisera that Barak had gone to the mountain. They had been sold out. And because of that family betrayal, the enemy knew exactly where to find the army of Israel. So now Sisera brought out all 900 of his iron chariots into the Kishon River Valley and sharpened their blades. Now Deborah and Barak are trapped up on that mountain with nowhere to go. If they come down from that mountain, those 10,000 men will be cut to pieces by the blades of the chariots. You can almost hear the critics, right, uh, in some of the other tribes saying, I told you that was a dumb idea. Barak must have wondered, is God deliberately trying to make it harder for me to break the devil's yoke? It was a defining moment of faith. Could they dare to believe God for such an unlikely victory? But church, I want to tell you, when the devil thinks that he's got you right where he wants you, in that moment, it's really God who's saying, no, I've got the devil right where I want him. Barak learned that when iron chariots come into view, God begins to move for you. And he remembered how God had said, Barak, I'm going to deploy Sisera against you. You see, God had been in control the whole time, and now God was positioning their enemy to receive a knockout blow. Once the enemy was in place, God began to move. First, God began to send some Holy Spirit encouragement. Deborah said to Barak in verse 14, Get up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? God used that prophetic word to strengthen Barak's courage and tell him that victory was on the way. See, the Holy Spirit now was building into Barak that old school Caleb kind of faith that he must have heard about from his grandpa, but which he'd never seen with his own eyes. That kind of faith that says, let's go get those giants. We'll eat them up like bread. Be encouraged that God's message of victory to us today, that the greater one lives inside you. Church, that Jesus came, it says, to destroy all the works of the enemy. That victory is assured because Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have some trouble, but be of good cheer because why? Because I have overcome the world. Then God began to send some Holy Spirit direction. Deborah says, get up because this is the day. And if we don't give up, but stay faithful in prayer, if we wait upon the Lord, I believe that God will not only renew our strength, like he says, but we'll also get to know his voice better and clearer. God will start to give us, like he gave Barak, Holy Ghost strategies and insights that will untangle the demonic confusion and the traps of the devil in our lives and in our family circles. Do you believe that God can give you specific direction and guidance so that you move out at just the right time that he appointed for your success and that he appointed for the devil's defeat? Some of us need to keep praying until we get a Deborah word, a Deborah word of timing that will shatter iron chariots. Worship team, you can come back, please, if you would. 
Finally, God moved powerfully by sending his own army out into the field to fight alongside them. Deborah says, Barak, the Lord has gone out before you. The ancient people of God knew it as well as we do. If God be for us, who can be against us? You see, God had a strategy to deal with those 900 iron chariots the whole time. We don't learn what it is in chapter 4, but when we get into their song of praise in chapter 5, we find out. Deborah said, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord. At Deborah's prophetic word, Barak stepped out in faith. And with tremendous courage, with him at the head of an army, they went down the mountain into the valley below. And when he did that, God moved again and God sent a powerful rainstorm in a time of year where there's no rain. You know, for much of the year, the Kishon River is just a dry riverbed. Sisera is way too smart to send his chariots out in the rainy season. But that day, in unexpected torrents of water, Sisera's iron chariots became hopelessly stuck in the mud. Instead of killing machines, his chariots became death traps, useless carriages that the Israelites swarmed and overcame. With every bolt of lightning that he saw in the sky, Barak must have laughed, thinking about his own name that means lightning and giving thanks for the power of God. And you know, from the moment the first raindrops started to hit, Israel knew that God was taking away the devil's advantage. Sisera himself, the devil's chosen general, jumped out of his own chariot and started running for his life. He kept right on running and running until he fell asleep exhausted. And when he did, he was killed by a woman as he slept, just as Deborah had also prophesied. Church, this story tells us God always has a plan to rescue you. He always has a way to take away the devil's advantage. Deborah says the mountains gushed before the Lord. Church, I'm here to tell you this morning that God has a mudslide for every iron chariot. For every crafty scheme of the enemy, did you remember that King Jabin's name means wise? For every crafty scheme of the enemy, God has a trap that the devil didn't even see. The Bible says he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And the very thing that the enemy trusted in became their downfall. After that day of deliverance, we read that Israel kept on fighting Jabin until they eliminated his power. And listen, a generation that had never tasted victory before, now they had a story to tell their grandchildren. Take courage today, church, because the Lord has gone out before you also. He's marching out ahead of you for victory in every area of your life. He's marching out for your kids and for your marriage. He's marching out for your health and he's marching out for your checkbook. He's marching out for the needs of our church and for the move of the Holy Spirit in our region. I want you to know it made no earthly sense for Barak and his men to leave the safety of a mountain that no chariot could have climbed and run down into a valley, trusting in a prophetic word from a woman. But as they arrayed themselves for battle, God encouraged them. He gave them direction, and they trusted that he really had gone on ahead of them. God will do the same for us, for you and for me. If we dare to come down the mountain and believe God for an unlikely victory, if we dare to stand together in unity, and if we dare to stand and fight for our inheritance, then I know 
that God will give us victory over the devil's iron chariots. Come on, stand together with me. Let's give Jesus a hand of praise. Come on, give him a good clap offering today.